This is the fifth week in our One Another series, and we've been discovering, uh, really, I mean, we hear each one of these things. If you're like me, I, I take it personally about my relationships, but, but these are one another's. These are about how the church is supposed to function, and, and I, I hope that one thing that you've heard is, is that God intends the church to be a community people who live in such a way and reflect him in such a way that other people in the world see that God is alive because of the way that we treat each other. And it's yes, it's important that we treat people beyond the church the same way. But first and foremost, these one another's are spoken to us. And in this, I've been pointing out the, the metaphors. We went through that last week about the church. And uh, today, I have a, 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 for you visual learners, I, I, have, I have a graphic. It's really something if you want to put that up there. And uh, the church is like a family, right? And it's not just a five-person family with a mother and father and three children, but it's a oikos, it's a household. Uh, you know, it's extended family, people in with us. But the church is like that, and the church is like a body. Um, if, if I could have, I would have detached the arms and the legs and made them all separate because he said you're, you know, remember when Paul was teaching about that, he says uh, someone's the head and someone's the eyes and the ears and I don't know what all he named, but we've each got our own function was what he was saying. We talk about the church and, and then the church is like a temple. The church is the place, the, the body of believers is the place where, where God comes and meets the world in us. And that's what the temple really was in the Hebrew terms, was that they went to the temple because God's manifested himself in the temple. In the same way the church is to be that place where God manifests himself. And we don't perhaps think of the church of that way. But, but that's one of the metaphors. And then last week we had where we're like building stones, where we're all fitted together. We're like a building. And each one of these speaks of unity and today we come to our fifth one another, and it is forgive one another. And there, there are a lot of passages on this. Uh, Paul uh, speaks to the Ephesians on this, and, and I've chosen the Colossian passage from Colossians three twelve to 13. He says, Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. So God calls us to forgive one another, and obviously that doesn't mean that we're never going to get offended. I think it's implied that we will get offended. There are going to be things that happen. We're often going to be offended by someone else, and that doesn't mean that we'll we're never going to have someone say something in church that, that doesn't hurt us or embarrass us. I mean, it's implied that that is going to happen in the body. That's the need for forgiveness. We're going to get rejected, and we're going to feel like sometimes people don't like us, people don't appreciate us, and it doesn't mean that we're never going to get mad because we're going to get mad sometimes. That's what happens. We're people. Instead, what he says is forgive one another just like Christ has forgiven you. Now, Paul's point to the churches was that to the degree that they loved one another and forgave one another, just like Jesus, to that degree, people in the world would see that Jesus was alive. They'd say, look at, look at the community. He's obviously alive because they're different than everyone else. Look, look they, they resemble him. It's the way they treat each other. Now, think about this today. Um, the, the demographics of the Western church, you know, what's left of the European church and, and the American church today, has become so homogenous, so, you know, same. Uh, there's, there's not that much diversity in congregations. I mean, there's, you've got the white suburban church, you've, you've got uh, the Hispanic church, you've got the, the African-American church, there's the rural church, there's the, the inner city church, there's the, you know, now there's the hipster church, yay, and uh, there's the old church, you know. But 
we, we, we tend to gravitate to people who are like us is what we want to do because differences make us kind of uncomfortable. I mean, that's, that's, that's not a sinful thing. It's just the way things are. I mean, people that are different from us, we just naturally, you know, have a few rough edges there. So the, the early church was much different than that. The early church had a great deal of diversity. I mean, there's, I've gone through this before. There's Jews and there's Gentiles. And that, that was probably as large of a cultural difference, the Jews and the Gentiles being in the same congregation, as it would be if we had kind of a, a white Protestant group mixed with some recent people from Pakistan who were Muslims and just became Christians. You can imagine the kind of cultural clashes and misunderstandings that we would have across those cultures. And the Jews and the Gentiles were about the same kind of things. So my, my point here is that there's an extreme likelihood of, of hurt because of the diversity that they had, and yet somehow they managed to make it work because they loved one another, they accepted one another, so forth and so forth. Do you know that the average church size in America is 70 people? Um, that's probably not an accident. Um, that's a sing, what we would call a single cell. It's uh, 70 people can function and everybody knows each other and uh, there's uh, you know, just one cell. They all function kind of as one family, one community. When you start to grow over 100 people, you have to go to multiple cells. And when you get to that point, then what you get is you get two groups. And sometimes the two groups don't get along real well, and there's a little bit of tension between the two groups. And, you know, um, I've, I've watched that sometimes in Sunday school classes. It's been uh, through the years I've watched like a, there maybe you'd have two or three Sunday school classes and adult Sunday school classes. And one of the adult Sunday school classes were for the scholars. You know, they're going to study the Bible. Then the other Sunday school class didn't really like them because, you know, they studied the Bible. We love each other is the other Sunday school class. And they'd, they'd name some, themselves something like one's Bible study and the other, the other was, you, you know, um, I, I don't know, middle agers on mission or something. But they'd always find, find themselves some kind of name that showed what they were about. And they didn't really like each other. You know, there's always some, some tension going on there in a, in a multi-cell church that's always going on. You got a group of people that are, are together and it's kind of difficult to get close in that. So I was also thinking about what the American church gets upset about, you know, the kind of things that we fight about in, in church in America. And, uh, we, we make comments like, you know, well, I don't like those people the way they come to worship. I don't think anybody should wear a T-shirt. Or, or who does he think he is? He wears a tie every week. Or does she think it's some kind of fashion show the way she comes to worship every week? Those are the kind of things that we talk about in the American church that divides us, you know. Uh, why don't we use the hymnals that they bought with, with grandma's uh, memorial money. You know, it's, uh, I, I don't like the screen, uh, you know, the song's too fast and all that really pretty petty stuff. Kind of, uh, you know, really first world problem you stop and think about it. Because if this is correct, and I think it is who's saying it, we are living in the midst of the greatest persecution of the Christian church in Christian history. Right now, I mean, Christians are under severe persecution in many parts of the world. And yet, we're upset about because he won't wear a tie or I don't like that him. Really first world kind of problems. But those are the kind of things that American Christians kind of rub up against each other on. But it's, of course, it's real to us because these are, are our differences. And the result of differences and words that are said then sometimes turns into thems and theys. And, and I always listen for that language when someone says, well, they, I go, well, who's in they? Do you know exactly who's in the they group? You know, because they seem to have some idea of this faction of people over here that they're in opposition to. Don't you hate it when stuff like that goes on? And you wonder why, you know, young people don't want to come to church. Well, they don't want to fight with people. Some, some of our churches fight a lot, you know. And uh, I'm not that we're immune from that. 
but, but certainly we have some sensors that are out there to say, we don't want to do that. We want to stop that. But a lot of times you can get the days and the nims going on as the factions of people. And we begin to think that since someone doesn't like what I like, that they don't like me. You know how quickly we make that jump. That they don't like the same things that I like. They don't like the same political party. So they must not like me. And the closer that we get together in a community, um, the, the easier that that begins to happen. And it really sounds so silly until someone says something about me or someone hurts me. And then, then it gets real personal, you know. And, it, and it, we just, ju- you know, go there in a hurry. It gets real. Now, I want us to look at something that Jesus said about this. Since he teaches, uh, he gives us some great insight. And this is in Matthew 18. 21 through 35. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brothers sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77 times. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and children and all that he had and payment to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him his debt. But when that same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a hundred denarii and seizing him, he began to choke him saying, pay what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, Have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. But when his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and reported to their master all that had taken place. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you and all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should not you have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also my heavenly father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. Wow. Well, kind of like a lot of the other um, parables that Jesus tells and realize this is a parable. It's not a story. It's a parable. There's an element of being ridiculous in here. Now, every one of his parables are kind of over the top to make the point. And, you know, Peter is probably thinking that he's being really a merciful guy to offer to forgive somebody seven times because the rabbis at the day taught, you know, three strikes you're out was what they taught. If, if somebody sins against you three times, that's it. You're done with them, you know. And uh, so he probably thought, you know, seven times is pretty good. And some of your translations won't say 77 there. There's, there's sometimes kind of a funny thing with numbers in the Bible. But some of your translations will, will say 70 times seven. I like the 70 times seven, 490 times. I think that's great. You know, it's like it doesn't really mean you keep track of 490 times. It just means, you know, uh, a gazillion times is kind of what Jesus is saying. Just, just so many means unlimited and in the first uh, servant owed 10,000 talents. And a talent was roughly 70 to 80 pounds of gold. And that's, you know, estimated to be at least $100 million is what he owed. Okay. So Jesus also is saying a man owed, you know, a gazillion dollars. He, he could not pay this back. And I think we get the point. And what the point is here is that Jesus is saying, that's kind of like your sin. (laughs) It is so much that you can never pay this back. Well, we have a debt sin against God that is so huge. But the man's forgiven. But he'll not forgive this other man who just owes him just this little, you know, pocket change. And the difference in the debts, I think, make the point. One is, you know, more money than you could ever imagine. And the other is just kind of what I got in my pocket. 
And so there's the point, I think, that we've received God's grace. And that has no measure, no end, no limits. And if we've received his grace and we demand justice of someone else, means we haven't really received his grace. We, we just don't get it. Now, forgiveness is, first of all, uh, an act of grace. As, as God has given us grace, his unmerited favor, so we are told to do the same for others in the church and beyond. And it has, has nothing to do with what we deserve or, or what they deserve. Forgiveness, first of all, is, is giving a gift to someone else. When you forgive someone, you're giving them the gift. And, you know, what, what we receive is, is God's grace and God chooses to forgive us and we don't deserve that forgiveness. Then he says, now since I've forgiven you, then you give some away too. As you've received, so then you give. And as, as Jesus lives in us and he, he comes out in our lives and he forgives others through us as we are willing to give and we receive forgiveness from him. And it's this endless cycle of God forgiving us and us extending that forgiveness to other people. We just let it go. I hope that we understand that, that God is not measuring you. God is not closely examining you to see where you've messed up today. He's not keeping a score. God wants to forgive, wants to extend to you his grace. Not because you deserve it, because nobody deserves it. Paul said to the Romans in, in Romans 5, 8, a, a verse that we love to quote because it's so important, important. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. See, not after we'd cleaned up our lives, but while we were still sinners and we didn't deserve it was when he, he died for us. And it's the one way that we can really tell if we are living in Jesus. Do I naturally forgive other people or do I have a need to get even? Do I have this need for justice? If I have a need to get even with others, then I'm not living in his grace. And this might help clarify what God means. Forgive does not mean that we forget. Um, forgive does not mean that we reconcile with the other person. That means the other person has to do something. We can't make them do that. Forgive means that we release the other person. The, the word uh, forgive here, the word group in, in the Greek, means just that, to release, to let go. And it has the implication that there was a debt and the debt is being let go. It's being released. And it doesn't mean that the two parties now are just like they were before that bad thing happened. That's reconciliation. That's, that's more than forgiveness here. But forgive is an act of grace and it means that we just release them from that debt that they owe to us. The Lord's Prayer, remember, says, forgive us our debts as we have forgiven our debtors. So when someone hurts us, uh, there's this debt relationship. We say, well, she owes me. He did something bad to me. He owes me. Okay, he hurt me. And I, I didn't start this. And, and they took something from me. And now they owe me. And to forgive, we cancel the debt and we say, he no longer owes me anymore. Because I choose to let it go. I choose to release it. They deserve justice. They, they deserve to get for me to get even with them. But I choose not to. In the same way that God has chosen not to get even with me, as God has given me his grace, and I choose to give grace there. And when we release them, we release ourselves because we no longer have to manage the debt. Years ago, I, I loaned a fairly large sum of money to somebody. Have you ever loaned, probably have, loaned money to somebody and they never paid you back? We, we've all done that, you know. One time we loaned uh, you know, a substantial amount of money uh, to somebody and 
Uh, he really needed it, and uh, I didn't feel bad doing it. He asked for it, and I jumped on it quickly and said, yeah, we want to do this. We want to help you, and, and he didn't pay, and he didn't pay, and he didn't pay, and you know, kind of wore on, and you know, he was supposed to pay me so much a week, and that didn't come in, and and so he began to avoid me. You know, he'd, he'd see me, and then he'd, you know, oh, I got to go do something else, and uh, we we'd been not close friends, but you know, we'd been chummy. It really began to bug me, and every time I saw him, all I thought about was the money, and I thought about, oh, he's got money for cigarettes, but he didn't have money to pay me, right? He's got money for cable TV didn't have money to pay me, you know. So um, I, I learned something in that. And the first thing that I learned was I, I learned to never loan a friend money that I was not willing to give to the friend. If you're going to loan it to him, you got to be willing to give it to him. And, and the second thing was I told him, I said, you know, I just want you to have this money. I, I've changed my mind. I don't want you to pay me back. I just want to give it to you, man. I just, just want to bless you with it. There. And we went on with life. I no longer have to have, had to manage his sin against me because that's what I was trying to do. As long as he was withholding what he had promised to give to me, you see, I was trying to manage his sin and it was tearing me up. Did he deserve the money? No. No, he didn't deserve the money. Did he deserve to be forgiven? No, you never deserve to be forgiven. No one deserves to be forgiven. And that's the point. It, it doesn't matter what they have done or whether they ask forgiveness or not. If we are willing for them to come to us and beg, if we're waiting for that, it's not grace. Do we want God to treat us the same way? We want God to only forgive us when we deserve to be forgiven? Well, I don't. So that's not forgiveness at all. You see, forgiveness is a choice. It's not a feeling. And this is where we all get mixed up in this because we're, we're emotional creatures and our feelings get, get mixed up in this. And in the same way that love is a choice and love is an action, the same way forgiveness is a choice and forgiveness is an action, we choose to forgive because to live any other way means that our life is going to be based on keeping track of someone else's wrongs and us living outside of the grace of God. But when we live in His grace and we extend that to others, even Christians in the church with us, okay, even though they are wrong and they do stupid things at times, we live forgiven, we live in grace, and life is not about guilt, life is not about measuring up to, to our standard, but it's about receiving from God his love and his forgiveness and extending that to someone else. It's hard. It's really easy for us to talk about when it's theoretical, but when it gets down to what somebody has done to us, it gets hard. And, and you know, I'm not wanting to make life of this. I, I, know, I know some of you have had some things done to you probably that's worse than what's been done to me. And it's been done to you by people who are supposedly better people than who I am. Okay? It's, it's really difficult when Christians hurt us. And especially when they have this kind of persona in the community that they're such a good person, and then, and then they really get us bad, okay? I, I know it's, it's really hard. It makes it much more difficult. But we have three choices as I see this here. The first one is, is that we can just ignore it. We can just suppress it. We say, oh, they didn't hurt me. No problem with me. No, I'm fine, you know? We can just suppress it on down and just boil on the inside there. You know, it's just like pretend that it never happened. The second one is we can hold on to it. We can itemize the wrongs. We, we can calculate everything that's done. Oh, I know everything that's been said and done. I can rehearse this over and over. And if we do, it's just going to get worse. You know, we're gonna, it's going to turn into bitterness. It's going to turn into deep resentment. And, and here, here's what's really bad about that is that we have to live with ourselves when we get like that. We have to live with a bitter person ourselves. Or, you know, we can forgive it. They, they, they credit uh, Nelson Mandela with this quote. I, I don't know if it was Nelson, it, and I've heard it in some different ways, but it goes, unforgiveness 
And sometimes they'll put hate or anger in there. Unforgiveness is like drinking poison and expecting it to hurt someone else. And it does. It eventually just kind of ruins us. Unless we choose to forgive. Seldom do we feel like it. If we're waiting to feel forgiveness, it's probably not going to come. In fact, there'll be, there's, I think there's a wrongness to the way this feels. It's not natural. They don't deserve it. Somehow we're going against the justice system of the universe. And we think that, you know, what, for me to let them off isn't, isn't right. They won't learn anything. It's, it's never going to feel right. You know, that's, that's my personal take on it. It's not normal. But it's just like Christ. Because that's what he does, isn't it? It's just like him. Colossians uh, 2, 13 and 14, wonderful passage of scripture. We, we, we need to go there every so often. Jesus said, or excuse me, Paul says to the Colossians, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all of our trespasses by canceling the record of debt. Did you hear that? The record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. I just love that picture. I, I, I can just picture a, a scroll of my sins that go all the way back to that quarter that I, that I stole out of my dad's change when I was five. You know, all of those things, all of that junk that we've done in life. And Jesus is up there on the cross and he, he pulls out his 22-ounce framing hammer and he just puts a big old nail in the cross and nails it up there on the cross. He says, it's canceled. It's over with. Do I deserve that? No, I don't deserve that. Did I earn that? No, in no way did I earn that. It's a gift. We all have a bill of debt that's been compiled. All of the lies, all the times we said, me first, take me first, okay? It's amounted, he says, to more than 10,000 talents. Truckloads full of gold is what, it's, what it is. That's how many there are. And our debt to God was more than all of that. And Christ took that debt and he nailed it to the cross. And while he was up there, he looked down at the guys, uh, the Jewish guys that had orchestrated the whole thing to get him crucified. And he looked down at the Romans who had tortured him all night. And you know what he said. Father, forgive them. Their debt against me. I release it, Father. I release their debt against what they've just done. They've taken my life unjustly. I forgive them. And he says to us, well, you know, that's how we do it. That's what he says to the church. He says, that's how we're going to live. We're going to live in that way. That although bad things are done to you, sometimes by people in the church, you're just going to say, I forgive them. Because that's what Jesus does. You're going to be like me. You're going to channel me. Did you see the movie Dead Man Walking or read the book? It was years ago. It was a great movie. Um, true story of a Catholic sister named Helen Prejean. Um, she was the author of the book Dead Man Walking and talked about one of the, the heroes of her faith, uh, Lloyd Lee Blanc. Um, Lloyd was the father of David LeBlanc, he was a 17-year-old who was murdered by Patrick and Eddie Saunier. And, you know, you see that story. It's just, oh, uh, it's heart-wrenching if you're a parent. But after that whole thing was over and those two boys had, had, had killed, um, the neighbors started harassing the mother of the boy who had committed Mrs. Saunier. Uh, for her son's actions. And Lloyd LeBanc, who was the father of one of the boys who was killed, uh, came to her house with a basket of fruit as, a, as an offering of his love for her. And Lloyd told Mrs. Sonia that he was a parent too, and he understood that she wasn't responsible for the murder. Well, utterly amazed uh, by that act of forgiveness, 
Uh, the interviewer in this story asked Prejean, this, this sister, she says, how, how does a parent do such a thing? And Helen Prejean replied with the following story. She says, Lloyd told me how the sheriff had brought him to the morgue to identify his son's body. And David was a beautiful kid, 17 years old. He had been shot in the back of the head. And when the sheriff pulled his body out on the cold tray, Lloyd, who was good with his hands and could fix things, looked down at his son and thought, I can't fix this. And he began to pray. He came to the line in the Our Father about forgiving those who trespassed against us. I didn't feel it, he said, but I knew that was where I had to go. And that's where he went. Lloyd, Brijan says, Lloyd embodies forgiveness, not just something we can do for others, but forgiveness that says, I'm not going to let anger and hatred kill me. I'm going to remain kind and loving. And then I love this line. Forgiveness is a path, not a single act. One's commitment to it has to be renewed every day. Boy, isn't that true? It's not a one-time thing ever. Thankfully, probably none of us will have to walk up that hill with our son to that cross like this father did with his son. Uh, our one another forgiveness will seem much more ordinary, seem much more daily, not nearly probably as painful, but still a choice. Will we as kingdom people, will we as representatives of the king choose to forgive first to release each other and then to release others who have hurt us in life will we choose to be that kind of people i think the world is watching i think the world is always watching to see if jesus is alive or not and today if you're struggling with forgiveness i don't don't know what's going on but if you're struggling with forgiveness today if someone that's that's hurt you deeply, the place to go is the cross. That's where we get the power. When we realize his forgiveness for us, we gain the power to do it for others. Let's, let's sit in prayer for a minute with that. As deep cries out. 